Well, good morning. My name is Rick. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you all today. I am so glad to see your smiling, well, I can't see your faces, your smiling faces, but I can see it in your eyes. Your eyes are just lighting up because I know you're smiling and happy to be here. I want to welcome all of you guys online that are joining us. I know that, uh, you know, it, it is different online, but we are hoping and praying that that you guys are connecting with the church or reaching out. You can send in prayer requests and, and be able to reach out to us, send us emails or give us a phone call if you need anything. We're trying to reach out to you guys as well just to stay connected as a church family and as a body of Christ. So we welcome you as well. So I want to welcome you especially to part three of our unexpected Christmas. I don't know what you guys are expecting for Christmas, but a lot of times for myself, sometimes when you run to the tree and you grab those presents, and my wife is sitting right back there, so every present I get is exactly what I wanted, and I love it. But I know some of you may get some unexpected gifts that you're not really expecting, and I know it it's, can be exciting and, and um, a little scary sometimes. You never know. You might end up with a toaster or a VCR for Christmas if you're listening to your kids and ask them what your wife wants. But that's a whole nother story. So before we jump into this message, I do want to remind you that um, to take some notes, dig into God's word. If you guys, if I say something today that makes you, you know, kind of think or scratch your head, or maybe you want to ask me a question about it, write it down. There's a study guide that is available for the series, and we we we, we create those for every series that we do, so that you guys have something that you can do together or as an individual study. But it's really important. Don't just take my word for it. Dig into God's word and see what He has to say to you. It's very important. So. As, as I said, or we've been talking about, when it comes to this unexpected Christmas, we're looking at the family line of Jesus. We're looking at his history of, of some of the unexpected relationships that popped up during his, his life and some of the things that are pretty amazing to look at in, in Jesus' her heritage. Now, as we start out in the series, for those of you who've been with us, and if you haven't, you can catch up on a, our website and just check out the uh, sermons that have been recorded, and you'll be able to check, catch up with us. But we're looking at the account of Jesus' life based on what Matthew has told us. Now, Matthew did it a little bit different. It wasn't quite like, you know, the really happy story and things like that, how he starts off like Luke does and tells us about the angels coming down and the, and the shepherds and the bells and, and, and the big star and the north star and, and going to the manger and all the really neat stuff. No, no, you know, Matthew starts out with this story of a, a genealogy, a long list of names of who begat who, but who begat who. But it's important for us to know that he had a reason why he did that. Now, there's two reasons. Well, the first reason is one is that he was speaking to primarily a Jewish audience. And this audience had to, there had to know a couple things before they would even pay attention to this story. He had to prove that Jesus was actually Jewish. So he talked about how he came from Abraham all the way to King David, because we all know that if you're going to be the Messiah, you had to be related to the great King David. That's what we're talking about when it comes to the reasons why Matthew had to start out with this genealogy. And it's pretty interesting. See, basically what Matthew's saying is, hey, let me tell you guys something. This Jesus, this Jesus, the Messiah, he is legit. He is Jewish, and he is related to all the right people, including King David. So that's why he starts out that way. But as we have kind of learned over the last few weeks when we're talking about Matthew and how he started his story. He didn't just tell us all the, you know, the highlights and the cool people and the really, really special people. You see the right people like King David and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of those guys. Matthew decides that he wants to highlight a few other people, a few mm, kind of crazy stories or maybe even PG-13, maybe even go as far as R-rated stories when it comes to some of these people he brings up. He points out some of the people who did some awful things. So we had to ask the question, and we've answered this question. We asked the question, why would Matthew do that? Why would he do this and, and throw out these kind of things that we would rather not talk about, these kind of family history things? I mean, just sitting here, I want you guys to just kind of close your eyes for a second and think, who's that person that pops in your eye and that you would really wish maybe we wouldn't bring up at the family dinner every single year, right? Are those people in your family or things that have happened in your life that you just don't want people to know about? Well, these are the kind of things that Matthew would bring up. And to answer the question as to why would he do it, it the answer is crystal clear. They are part of the story because they are the point of the story. That's what this is all about. 
Matthew is writing to this very religious group of people, these, these Jewish uh, heritage people, and in that religious group, they had this idea that in order for you to have a relationship with God and for them to have a relationship with God, that relationship was based on what they have done, the good things in their lives that they've done, that they followed the laws and all the rules and, 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 and avoided all the bad things. Now, that, that's one way to look at it. And, and the problem with that approach back then and today even, because I think some people think that way today, is that, well, it leaves a lot, a lot, a lot of people out. And it makes people think that if my approach to God is based on my own personal righteousness, me being good enough, I'm not going to make it, right? There's no way. There's no way that I am ever going to be good enough. There's no way that I'm ever going to have a relationship with God. And there's no way that I'm ever going to have this peace that God is talking about, the peace candle that we lit today. There's no way that I'm going to have that because there's always going to be conflict between me and God. I am just not that good. I can't do it. So what's the point? I'm never going to be good enough. So Matthew knows that he's about to, to launch into the greatest story ever told. The greatest story that could ever, ever be told to anyone. It's going to change the lives of not just the Jewish people in that community, it's going to change the lives of everyone. It's a story where humanity has been invited to approach God, to come to God with an open heart and an open mind. And it's not going to be this kind of thing about what I've done and what I haven't done. No, it's based on a relationship. It's be based on a, re a relational level, okay? Not based on what we have done or not done. It's based on the foundation of what God has done. And that foundation is what God has done on our behalf because we're never really going to be good enough to do the things that we think we need to do. We just can't do it, not without God, and God knew that. So he creates this relationship based on what God has done, what Jesus has done. So here's how it begins in Matthew, the genealogy I talked about. Let me read this to you. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's Jewish, right? That's where we get that. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, who was, <coughs> whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amminadab. Amminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Solomon. Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Now, for a Jewish audience, they're reading this, and they're like, okay, check, check, check. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Rahab? Why in the world, Matthew, would you bring up Rahab? Now, they're kind of freaking out a little bit about this Rahab because, well, throughout the Bible, um, a lot of people had nicknames. A lot of people. And it's very common for you to have one name that was associated with another name. And when it comes to different nicknames. There's a lots of them. There's um, Uriah the Hittite. There's John the Baptist. There's uh, Simon the Zealot. Peter the Rock. One of my favorites is James and John. They were given a nickname, the Sons of Thunder. I think of them as like this tag team wrestling guy, you know, where it's Sons of Thunder, and they're jumping off the top rope, right, bringing down the thunder. So that's what I think about these really cool nicknames. And we like to give Nicknames to historical figures, too. People like Alexander the Great, right? He was great. Attila the Hun, Hun, Conan the Barbarian, and Jabba the Hutt, right? <laughs> okay, so anyway, throughout history and fiction, it's not uncommon for people to have a word associated with them. So what about Rahab? What was her association to a word? Well, unfortunately, she was known as Rahab the harlot. Now, this creates some tension in the genealogy of Jesus. Rahab the harlot, the prostitute. These are things, these activities that were strictly forbidden by God. And to top it all off, Rahab wasn't even Jewish. She was a Canaanite. Now, if you don't know your history, the Canaanites were the enemy when it came to 
the Jewish people. They were the people who were occupying the promised land that was promised to them, the Jewish people, by God. She was the enemy. So think about this. Just as we launch the Christmas story, the stars and the bells, the angels and mangers, we have Rahab the harlot. That doesn't really fit into a Christmas song really well. Where's Nate? Nate, can you throw that in one of your songs later? Rahab the harlot? Here's the thing. Matthew could have skipped over her. He didn't really have to mention Rahab the harlot. But he lists her as a part of the story because of why? Because she's the point of the story. It's exactly why she's there. It's the point of the story. It's an incredible story of grace, mercy, forgiveness, and inclusion. So let's take a look at at Rahab's story. Um, If you want to follow along, I'm going to be in Joshua chapter 2 and chapter 6. You can pull that up on your phone or flip to it in your Bible. But but here's the context. The Jewish people had just been released from slavery. The story of Moses, right? Moses goes to Pharaoh, let my people go. Okay, no, no, no. And they fight over it. Eventually he lets them go. So they take off and they're headed for the promised land. Now they had been in slavery for over 400 years and Moses leads them out to the land that God had promised them. This is where we're at. So as they're out there wandering, they they come to the Jordan River and they cross the Jordan River and they move into an area that is controlled by the city of Jericho. You may have heard that story too, the city of Jericho where they march around and the walls come down. So Joshua, who is this leader following Moses, decides, you know what I'm going to do? Before we rush into Jericho, I'm going to send a couple of spies in there. And these spies, they sneak into Jericho, and they're going to kind of check things out, right? They want to know who's there, how powerful they are, how many men do they have, you know? What do their defenses look like? And they, they're in this city. Well, they get spotted while they're in there, so they run into this house, Rahab's house, and they hide. Now, the king there in Jericho... He's got his own spies. He's got his own guards out there. They spotted these two people. They knew they weren't from there. So they send some guards to Rahab's house, and they knock on the door. And they go to the knock, and they get to Rahab's house, and Rahab opens the door, and, they say, and the guards tell her, they said, hey, we hear you have some Hebrews in here. They snuck in. Are they still here? And she's like, no, no, no. They, they, they left. We waited till almost nightfall before the city gate was locked, and they ran out, and they went through the gate. If you hurry, you can catch them. So these guys, these guards, they, they round up a posse and they take off out the gate and they go, are going looking to catch these two Hebrew spies. So now here, here we go. Rahab has lied to her people and she goes upstairs back to, the, uh, to have a conversation with these two Hebrew spies. And this is where we pick up in the text. And listen to this. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. We heard, we, we heard of it Our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now remember this, Rahab is not Jewish. She's a Canaanite, and the Canaanite have this whole list of gods that they have. So here's here's Rahab, the harlot, that is not Jewish, of another religion talking to the Hebrews about their God, the God. She's like, in spite of what I've been taught all of my life about all of these gods, you see these Canaanite gods that have been in my life since I was a little girl, I have come to believe in the reality of your God. Me and my family, we believe that your God is the God, the one and only God. So there's this amazing sense of faith that Rahab has. She doesn't have all the context. She hasn't ever read, the, you know, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. She doesn't know the story. She only knows of what God has done for the Hebrew people as they are escaping Egypt. And that's enough for her. That's an amazing faith that Rahab has. So then she says to the, to the spies, Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. 
Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and my mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. So the spies tell her, our lives for your lives, these men men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us this land. So she makes a deal with them. She says, hey, if I help you, you guys help me, right? And they assure her, yes, we will. And, they, and then so Rahab, she, teach, or she teaches them. She shows them how to escape. Just so happens that Rahab's house is actually built into the city wall that protects the city. She has a window, and she lets them sneak out of that window so they're already outside and they can bail. So they run, and they go back to Joshua, and they tell them that, hey, Joshua, Jericho is scared to death of us. They are not only scared of us, they are scared of God. This should be so easy. We will march right through that town. So here's how the story ends up over in chapter 6. This is after they have taken the city. Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. She lives among the Israelites to this day. I love that phrase because it makes it so real. Because if you're a Jewish reader and you're reading this story, she she was still alive when they are reading this story with the Israelites. Can you believe that? She's alive among the Israelites. And this is a picture, an illustration that God is a God of mercy and grace. I mean, who, by all rights, this Canaanite woman who did not know God and was, you know, a, a harlot should have been judged and executed by the law. Yet Rahab, her family, are still living among the Israelites. The story tells us that she's there to this very day. Now, what the Bible doesn't tell us is this, is that she lives with the Israelites. For a long time, she's learning of them. She's learning of their culture. She's learning about, about God and who God is and what God wants for their lives and the plan that he has for the Israelites. And so one day comes this man, Solomon, comes to her and says, Hey, I'd like to have a cup of coffee with you. So they have a cup of coffee because Hebrews brew, right? They make great coffee. So they have this wonderful Hebrew coffee. And they go, and they start to build a relationship. And then one day they have dinner. And then they get to know each other a little bit better. And then Sal- Solomon comes to Rahab, and he's like, I was just wondering, maybe would you marry me? Think about that. A Jewish man marries a Canaanite woman. This former prostitute, they get married, and they live happily ever after. They have a baby, and they decide to name him Boaz. I don't know why they named him Boaz, but they did. And Boaz grows up, and when he is a grown man, he's introduced to a woman named Ruth. Some of you may have heard of Ruth. She has her own book in the Bible. It's an amazing story of faith when you read about her. So he marries Ruth, and they have a baby. Boaz and Ruth's great-grandson is actually, guess who? Wait for it. King David. King David. So you see, Matthew pauses in this this moment when he's telling this story and brings up Rahab the harlot to get all the way from her to King David. He pauses to bring that up in their memory because he knew that Rahab illustrates the story, the entire story and message of Jesus in one moment. Here was this woman that was condemned by the law of Moses. In fact, they had just received these laws, if you remember right. The ink hadn't even dried yet or well, actually, it would have been stone where they tapped it into the stone. So they hadn't even blown the dust off of the rocks yet. And here it is, God saying, you know what? Yes, I've given you my law, but my grace is broader. My grace is bigger. My grace is wider than my law. My mercy is bigger. My mercy is broader, is greater than my judgment. My love and my forgiveness are wide enough to surround you. So yes, God gives us the law, but he also gives us grace and forgiveness. Even though she's guilty of her lifestyle, even though she's an outsider because of where she was born, God intentionally incorporates her into the lineage of Jesus, the Christ. It's absolutely amazing if you think about it. So 
an illustration, a demonstration of God's grace and love and forgiveness. Think about the lifestyle that she lived, and she is related to Jesus. But you know what? I don't think that story is that far off from from our stories. I think if we look at Rahab the harlot and we start to peel back the layers, if I was able to look into your lives that way, look into my own lives and peel back the layers of my heart, peel back the layers of my thoughts and look at my public and my, my private behavior, look at my past behaviors and think about the things that you don't want people to know about you, there's a good chance that, that we may have labels just like Rahab. Now, I'm not saying we're all prostitutes or whatever, but I think we have our own labels. In fact, maybe you're back in church today for the very first time here or online, and it's because you're thinking about that label that you have, or maybe that's why you don't feel like you could even be a part of the church. Maybe your label has just been discovered and you're feeling humiliated. Some of us and some of you have have tried to distance yourselves from your past or your past labels, and every now and then you run into somebody that says, oh, I remember you. I remember what you did. I was there. I remember who you were. And you have that label in your head of of maybe an ex-husband or an ex-wife, and you wish so much, so badly that you could go back and undo what you've done to change that label, but you know you can't. And some of us have labels because we have secrets, and some of us have labels because we have these hurts and habits and hang-ups and these addictions that we deal with in our lives, and these are all these labels that are in our mind of who we are. You know, I am this, I'm I'm, I'm an alcoholic, I'm this, I'm that. You know, I made these labels that drive us completely mad. And I was thinking about this, and I wanted to describe some of these labels, and maybe some of these speak to you guys, maybe not, but... Maybe there's someone like Carrie the coveter, Grace the greedy, Gary the glutton, Larry the luster, Chelsea the cheater, James the jerk, Sam the swindler, Adam the addict, Barry the boozer, Jeannie the jealous, and Rick the, well, there's a lot of names people call me. I can't really say them in church, but for lots of us, our labels get in the way of us approaching God. Because we want to have that relationship. We want to build that relationship with Christ. We want to have what we see in other people's lives. We want to be a part of a kind of a relationship that changes people's lives every day. We see it in our family members. We see it in our friends, and we want to have that. So we take that step towards God, but then our mind, that label, that neon sign starts blinking in our head, and we're like, there's no way. There's no way I can't be a part of the church. I can't be a part of the activity and the lives of of the people in that church. Who am I? I am not worthy. God is never going to accept me for the things that I've done. I can't be a part of a life group because of this label. You see, the problem with labels is they can can take on a, a life of themselves if we let them. If we buy into them, I heard about this call. It's an anonymous call that Pastor Aaron got. There's this young lady, and she was struggling and having a hard time. And someone said, you should probably call the church and talk to Pastor Aaron. So when she called, she she didn't give out, give us her name or give Aaron the name, but she did just kind of start pouring out her, her heart to him. And she said, my lifestyle has caught up with me. She said, I'm that girl. Pastor Aaron's kind of like, what do you mean? She says, well, I'm that girl at the bar that flirts with the guys. I'm that girl that will do anything to please people. I'm I'm that girl that that the regulars know is kind of easy. I'm that girl who will be yours for the first, for for the night if you buy me just a few drinks. And I'm that girl who, who messed up and got pregnant. And now I'm that girl who, who had an abortion. I feel so ashamed, she said. I feel like that girl has imprisoned me and I can't get out. Now Matthew, I think, would understand that story. Matthew would understand that story because Matthew had a label too. And this label, the Matthew the tax collector, is what made him the most hated person in his society, his, among his own people. 
But one day, there he is standing eyeball to eyeball with Jesus, and Jesus is looking at Matthew, and Matthew is like, there is no way that I could ever be one of his disciples. I understand who he is, and I know what he's done, and I've seen the miracles that he's had that has happened through his hands and through his touch. But I'm Matthew, the tax collector. I'm Matthew, the, the unloved. I'm the Matthew, the unworthy. Because of this stinking label, I can never have a relationship with Christ. But you know what Jesus does? Jesus looks him right in the eye and he says, I know about your label, Matthew. And I know that it bothers you and I know it drags you down. And I know you're ashamed of it, but that's not what it's all about, Matthew. What I want you to do is I want you to come follow me. Come follow me first. And then... We will work on your your stuff along the way. See, what Jesus didn't say to Matthew was, he didn't say, Matthew, man, I would really like for you to be one of my disciples, but what I need you to do first is I need you to clean up your act. I need you to go and, and change your life. Get rid of the things that are wrong in your life. Get rid of your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups. Get rid of all the, the, the sin in your life first. Go back and pay all the people that you've been cheating over the years. And then once you've done that, once you've changed, then come to me. Come and be my disciple. No, Jesus did not tell him that. He just said, come, follow me, and we'll fix your broken stuff along the way. You see, Jesus' righteousness did not overshadow his mercy. Jesus' righteousness and his holiness will never overshadow his grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish. There's no caveat if they change or if they do this, this, and this. Only to believe in Jesus. His gift of forgiveness was broad enough to incorporate and encompass all of us. All of our labels. No matter what our label is, Jesus has us covered. So Rahab the harlot became the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus, the Christ. And in doing that, she became the point of the story. You see, the message of Christmas and the message of Jesus is that we have all been invited into a relationship with him. We've all been called to be a follower of Christ. Even though we still have our labels, even though we still have our troubles and our trials and our tribulations, he wants us to be a disciple. He wants us to be one of his followers. He has invited us to be a part of his life. God has leaned into our world, into our life, and he just asks that we lean back into him, that we have been invited to approach God, not based on anything we've done or, or haven't done, but based on what God has done for us. Even while you're still wearing that crazy, crazy label, God loves us. He wants to invite us into a relationship so that he can demonstrate that kind of love and grace and mercy and forgiveness that he offers to all of us. That we may experience for the first time or the thousandth time, and when you're speaking about joy, and, 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 I, and I look at Micah out here, you guys couldn't see him online, but he's out here dancing while his dad's up here playing, and I see the joy in that, and I see, I remember back to my, my, my two boys, and I come home from work, and they're little, and they're playing in, a, in the mud, and they're making mud pies, and the smile on their faces, I mean, you all have stories of joy in your life, those moments where Christ has touched you, and that's the kind of joy that God has called us all to be a part of. So I want you to understand something. You don't have to negotiate anymore. You don't have to make any deals with God. All the work has already been done. We don't have to to think that we're at war with God because God has already won the war. He has overcome this earth. He's already taken care of all those things. And that is the whole point of the unexpected Christmas. Because we are all welcome to accept this unexpected gift of grace and love and forgiveness that God offers. Maybe you're already in that place and you you have this wonderful relationship with Christ and, and you're living that out in your life every day and that's great. But I want you to know that God has called you to share that story 
that unexpected Christmas with those people in your, in your life. He's counting on us to do that. And if you're not there yet and you still don't know, and those of you online, if you're, if you're looking at the screen and you're watching, you're like, man, Rick, that sounds great. And everyone here, you're all thinking the same thing. Man, that sounds like a great idea, but forget about that. Just let that go. And I want to I pray with you. I want to pray a simple prayer with you, and I want you guys to all bow your heads and close your eyes and, and online do the same thing. And as I pray this prayer, I want you to, to repeat it back. Heavenly Father, I believe your grace is more powerful than my label. I believe Jesus died to pay for the sin of my labels and what they represent. Teach me how to live. Teach me how to live my life according to who you say I am. In the name of Jesus, I pray all these things. Amen. Now may you all continue to lead people to an act of faith in Jesus. May you all continue to lead people to an act of faith in Jesus, the Christ, his label, the Messiah. As these guys are going to get ready to play another song, I just wanted to remind you, as being part of this church, we like to give back to, to God's, God's tithes and our offerings. I know in this time, it's a little different now. We don't pass baskets and all that. And we have a basket in the back of the room. You can drop your gift there or, or online. There's three online. You can text to give. You can uh, mail, your, mail, mail your offerings in. There's, there's several ways. But before you, before you do that, I want you to think about this give a gift, change a life. So we have an opportunity as a congregation to, to reach out into our world and make a difference. Just as God has reached into our world and changed our lives and blessed our lives. Think about the opportunity we have to change the lives of, of, of a foster child who is struggling and needing help. To reach out to Nicaragua. They, they just went through that hurricane and, and the, the things that are going on in their lives over there and the poverty that they live through. So pray about that and think about that. That give a gift, change a life and, and your regular offerings. But... Just know that, that God has a plan for your lives and that he has called us all to be like his son, Jesus. And I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you.